So hopefully you're all in the right place, the right time. This is the Ready for Nursery um, uh, webinar. And we're thinking about um, really how to support children at this important point of change. So we talk about it being a transition and it certainly is. It's when the child is moving into nursery. So they may um, have had lots of experiences of preschool, um, uh, events before that in attending um, drop-ins and things at the children's centers and libraries or you may have had your child at home or with a childminder and they haven't had so much experience so we're just going to look at a kind of all of those children and how to support them into nursery and obviously as my background is speech and language therapy we're going to be looking particularly at their communication and how to support their developing communication. So aims for this session are to develop an understanding of the importance of communication skills and how to support them with your child. And to do that, we're going to look at how children's speech and language should look um, at any particular age. And we know there's no such thing as an average child. All children develop differently. And some of your children will be bi and trilingual. Some will be monolingual. So that although, you know, there is no such thing as that set average child, it does help to look at other children and see um, if they are doing things that we would expect them to do at their age. So we kind of look at um supporting them and com not comparing them as such but just using other children as a kind of benchmark to see are they where we want them to be and if not this is absolutely the right time to support them because when they're so little you can make such a change with just a a, a little bit of support and we're going to learn how to help support to transition your child into nursery so we're going to start off by looking at communication and how children's communication develops. So um, we're thinking, we're just going to let two people in from the waiting room. Apologies. We're going to think about how communication develops. And if you think about it in this triangular shape, we're going to look at the things that develop first at the bottom and the last things to develop are the kind of what we call the icing on the cake the things that um, are important but they're not the first to develop so let's think of like the young baby um, who then moves into toddlerhood the first skill that children learn to develop really is looking and listening so a tiny baby is kind of here there and everywhere looking at everything startled by anything and they're almost on high alert and what we want to do as children go through babyhood into toddlerhood and then into school is help them develop their looking and listening skills and that's really important because people around young children have got a lot to say and we want to support them by being able to maintain their looking at something to keep looking at something or keep listening to something um, so that they can get the most out of for example uh, the nursery environment when the teacher is telling them a story or giving them some instructions and <clears throat> young children need help in developing these attention and listening skills very often and we'll talk about how we can do that and then as the baby begins to look and listen and begin to see that they have an effect on the world, their play and interaction skills develop. And play is called the work of children and it is very, very important. It's the way they make sense of the world. It's the way they see what they can do and what they can't do in a safe way. And it also goes hand in hand with their language development. So you see that when children are able to sequence their play which means putting baby into the bath then taking baby out and putting baby in a high chair and feeding it um, likewise their language is probably developing into uh, a sequence language I went to the park and I saw a duck and I had an ice cream um, so we're looking at play skills and they should be developing nicely um, as we move into uh, nursery and reception age. And if something's amiss, then we need to support it. 
And then comes understanding. And it's right that understanding comes before children are able to say words. And if you think about it, it's right. When you say to a tiny toddler, where's the ball or where's daddy, they point or they wander over and get that object. Um, but they're not saying the word yet. So there can be about a six months difference between a child understanding a word and being confident and able to use it. So we see understanding coming first. And then we get the talking. So that's when you hear children beginning with single words, then being able to link words together and eventually um, being able to say little sentences and join together with, with uh, it, joining those sentences together. And then right at the top are accurate speech sounds. So when you see a little child and they point at a bus, they don't say, oh, there's a lovely red bus. They're more likely to say something like bus because the sir at the end of bus is a difficult sound for them to say, and we wouldn't expect young children to have it. So um, I'll just be giving you a little bit of guidance about what we would expect at our three-year-old stage, where we think their speech sounds should be, and when you might need to get a bit of extra help for that. Okay, so why is it important to develop communication skills? Well, language is vital in order to learn to make friends and feel confident. And when children have poor language skills, it puts them at risk of poor reading and writing, because if you can't say it, you're not going to be able to write it. Um, the children show this frustration sometimes in poor behavior, and that sets them off um, badly at school if they're exhibiting lots of poor behavior. And uh, long term, poor exam results and lack of success in school. So we really, really want to support children at this very young age as best we can to make sure that they're starting off in the best possible way when they go into nursery and later when they go into reception. Whoop, rushing ahead. So let's think about what your three year old should be able to do. And again, don't you know, be too concerned. This is just a rough guide about what they might be able to do. But what, one thing's for certain is that you probably are noticing a big increase between the ages of two and three in terms of talking. They're understanding more and they're saying more. Um, and that's as it should be. And by um, the age of three, you as the parent or caregiver should probably be able to understand a, a lot of what your child says. You'll still find that some things are unclear, but the majority by three um, parents usually understand. OK, we're going to think about attention and listening, first of all, because we said what an important skill that is so that they're not missing out on things that they're being told. And sometimes we overestimate, we think that children should have more attention um, levels, you know, higher attention levels than they really are capable of at this very young age. So at two to three years, we see children preferring activities of their own choosing. So it, they would rather stay playing with something that they've chosen and actually often can play with that choice of activity for quite a while. And to get that child to do something, it might seem like they're ignoring you if you say time to go and they carry on playing. But actually, they're so involved in what they're doing, they kind of cut out everything else that's going on very often. So you need to get their attention before you then give them an important message or tell them that it's time to go. And you do that by getting down to their level, calling their name before you uh, and getting them to turn to you before they'll do things. And turning to their name is an important skill. It's a safety thing that if you're out and about and you call their name, they stop and they listen and they turn to you. And also um, within the nursery classroom, because it means that teachers can make sure they realize that if they're giving a whole class instruction, that that child knows too. So they say, Hannah, and then you can um, that, see that that child realizes that the teacher means them as well. And then we're thinking about the three to four year old. So as they begin to develop, they are more able to switch their attention from what they're doing 
to something that the teacher's saying and they become more interested in what other people are doing and they probably respond quicker to instructions or prompts and enjoy and may well join in activities that the adult chooses or a peer, a friend uh, chooses for them. Okay, we're gonna do a little activity now. And I want you to have a look at this very pretty picture. Let me just get something on my phone. Okay, so are you ready to take notice of this very pretty picture? Um, I want you to study it, please. Bread, milk, broccoli, potatoes, sun cream, chickpeas, frozen peas, coconut milk, semi-skim milk, pasta, sauce and mushroom. Ooh, wow. How was that? Did, was that a comfortable activity for you? Or did you find it a little bit stressful? So what I did there was I gave you a very engaging, pretty picture of all this different colored pasta. And I also played a song and I also gave you a shopping list. Can anyone remember any of the items I asked you to buy at the shopping list? Was it broccoli? Well done, yeah, anything else? Mushroom, <laughs> mushroom. Oh yes, I did ask mushrooms at the end. Peace. Yes, good. Pasta. Yes, Ooh, we're getting there. So pretty good, you're adults and you are able to sort of filter out the nursery rhyme, looking at the picture, the shopping list, um, but it's impossible to do that all of, all of the time. I mean, you uh, and what we're thinking about is our very young children who might be in an environment where they've got pretty things to look at or exciting things to look at, like another adult pouring out juice for snack time or m mixing up a lovely colored paint. They may have music going in the background or they may hear other children singing or talking. And then there's this important message coming out with the shopping list or the teacher saying something that they weren't really listening to because they didn't know where their attention should go. Should they look at the pasta? Should they listen to the shopping list? Should they be singing along with the song? So that was just a, a, an experiment to show you how difficult, even as an adult, it is when we have things that are competing for our attention, which is why when we've got very little children, we want to keep things a little bit more subdued. And you'll notice now that nurseries are not the huge hugely colorful place they used to be so we used to see nurseries with things hanging off the walls and hanging down from the ceilings and brightly colored posters on the wall and lots of toys out but actually it's quite distra distracting for very young children and that's why we've moved towards um, hessian on the wall walls which is that kind of brown sack color to kind of mute things down a bit and not take children's attention away and very often um, that cuts that adds to the noise and it makes you less able to concentrate on what people are saying so this is just a, a, a kind of plea to make sure that when you're with um, your child and you want them to hear an important message or you're reading with them, something like that, actually cut down the distractions around you as much as possible. Because for young children, it's very difficult when you've got different things competing for their attention. So if any of your children have been through speech and language therapy, you'll know this term special time. And this is just about supporting children's language, whether they're delayed with their language or not. It's still a great habit to get into. It's having this special time, which is just five minutes with an adult and one child where you're completely focused in on them. 
And it might not sound a lot, just five minutes, but everybody's got very busy lives. You've got a lot of other things to be doing. So five minutes is actually much more realistic than if we say, you've got to sit down with your child for an hour a day. You know, it's very, very hard to do that. So what we're saying is think about special time and you can call it that with your child um, for five minutes, at least three times a week where you cut down the distractions around you. So put your phone on silent, make sure siblings, other children are involved in something else. Let your child choose the activity or game. So that's what they're engaged in and that's where their thoughts are. And just let someone else in and um, continue to um, be engaged with them for that five minutes, sit where they can see you and make eye contact with you. So very often because we're busy, we might talk to children from the other room or from the kitchen sink, but really be there present for your child, giving your child that undivided attention and focus on what they're saying rather than the how they're saying it so that you can support their, their talking and help to extend it. So as a rule of thumb, what we like to do is model back for children. So if the child says bus, you model it back, but adding a word. So you say, yes, red bus. And if your child says big bus, you say, yes, big red bus. So you're always modeling back and expanding your child's language a little bit. Useful guidance for guidelines for special time is avoid reading a book or watching TV because the book becomes just you reading to the child rather than fully engaged together. Watching TV is quite passive and we want to um, cut down the amount of screen time very young children have. Minimize distractions. Have you noticed how on our big TVs that most of us have, when they put adverts on, the volume goes up a bit to try and pull your attention to watching those adverts. So try and turn off TVs and radios if you can and during special time. And it should be just you and one child sitting face to face to really be there for that child. Okay, so we're working our way through the pyramid now and we're thinking about play and what that might look like for our you know, developing nursery children. So um, we're hoping that children are beginning to develop sequence play, which is what we call doing one thing followed by another. So when you're very young as a child, you do something like just drop a, a toy over the side of the high chair. When you become two to three years old, we're hoping that children are beginning to sequence play. So can they take a baby doll, put it in a bath, get it out, give it its breakfast and pretend to walk it along the road? So all of those things are what we call sequence play. And actually, um, play and um, language go hand in hand. So when children are able to sequence their play, we're hoping that they're able to join their language together too. So they're able to say things like, I went to the park and I had an ice cream and then I saw daddy. So um, look out for how your child's play kind of matches up with their language. And that's a really important um, development stage. And they call play the work of children because it is so important. And by three to four years, um, we're hoping that children are beginning to use some pretend play, which is really helpful for them in terms of being able to step outside themselves and think what it might be like to be a mummy or a firefighter or a doctor or a vet. And dressing up is part of that and having inventive, imaginative characters and moving from big doll play, which represents a baby, down to small world play, which is another developmental stage and we're using um, small things to represent big things so when you pick up a tiny lego baby it's representing a real baby and don't forget words are just representations too so when you say the word baby it also means that uh, <laughs> baby that we're thinking of so all of those things are helping to support the journey to, to language as well. So top tips for play. 
follow your child's lead. It's quite easy as an adult to think, hmm, I know how to play with this. Let me show you what you do with this train and this tunnel or whatever. But actually, you might find your child wants to play in a different way. So follow your child's lead. Um, and see what they're doing with their play. And the uh, benefit of doing that is you can think about where their thoughts are. So if the child is more interested in the wheels of the train, you can talk about the wheels of the train rather than it going through the tunnel because that's where their thoughts are. And I'm sure Hannah Scaife, you've heard this a million times, but I talk about when I took my um, my daughter, when she was little, to the zoo and paid all that money to go in the zoo. And she was interested on, in the ant that was walking across her shoe, not the big elephant that was in front of her. So it would be better, actually, to match the language up about the ant rather than trying to force her to look at the other animal that was in front of her. And following your child's lead with play is a bit like that. It's following where their thoughts are at that particular time. Copying your child is a great way to, you know, empower them and to be really there in the moment with them, showing lots of interest. Oh, ends a bit abruptly there. Sorry. So play is really important. It's not just a pastime. It's really how they're learning. OK, moving up in our pyramid, we're thinking about how much a child understands. And forgive me if I've said this already, but this is the second session we've done today. So I'm not quite sure what I've already said in this session, but children hold on to language for six months or uh, often before they use it expressively. So we've got to support the understanding of words, first of all. And um, we they need to hear those words to understand them and they need to hear words in different contexts so that means you might show them a cup on your table um, at tea time and then you might have a cup in some play that you'll also talk about and then when you're out and about you might see someone dropping a cup as you walk past a cafe so all of those things are giving a child the chance to hear a word so that they're beginning to match the word they're hearing, the symbol of that word onto an object that they know about and storing it in their brain. And at two to three years, we would hope that children are beginning to understand some of those concepts like big and little in, on and under and understanding what we call key words in an instruction. So if I say to you, go and get your book, coat and bag, it's got those three key words, the ones that you really have to understand to get that instruction right. And they're beginning to understand basic questions. So who, who ate that? What happened or where did it happen? Um, but it's not till later on, by three to four years or even beyond that, that children are really able to understand what why questions are, uh, mean. Because with why, you've really got to have a lot of language to be able to understand it. So if I said to you, uh, or if I said to a little child who just pushed another child, why did you push so and so? Um, what are you really expecting them to say? Are they able to say, well, um, I'm a bit tired today because I'm teething and it's very hot, so I didn't sleep well and I heard my mummy and daddy argue? Of course not. But that's really why they push the child, because they're in a right old grump. So let's um, remember that our very young children don't understand those why questions. Um, and also, as they move into the three to four years, they're beginning to understand longer instructions. So go and get your jumper and then stand by the door. And those are the sorts of things that they'll be hearing at nursery. So beginning to give them some instructions like that at home and having fun with supporting them with it. So, oh, not your coat, go and get your jumper. And, you know, it's sort of, we call it scaffolding, just like scaffolding on, on a building. You want to support them with some of these more um, uh, complicated uh, communications, uh, instructions, and you can scaffold them by helping them along the way. 
So I put this in because to stay on track, to know enough words by the age of six or eight, children at this stage need to be learning eight words a day, which is a huge number. And of course, they don't, it's not in a little bag, right? Here's your eight words for today and here's your eight words for tomorrow. They're learning all of these things all of the time and they're getting clear on what words mean. So, for example, um, the word daddy, if you think about a tiny toddler in a buggy who points at the postman or um, the window cleaner and says daddy and everybody laughs because that's not daddy. Actually, the child is very clever. They've worked out that's a man and they just overusing the word daddy because they don't know yet that daddy just means that one special man. So um, children have got to learn and relearn and learn some more to know exactly what every word means. So um, you've got a big job ahead of you for everyone who's involved with little children. We've got to support them learning all of these words. And that's why it's so important to, um, get, to get access to books, go to your library and get books because books give us vocabulary, they give us words that we don't use every day at home. So at home, we tend to use the same old language. It's tea time, it's bath time. Give that to Sarah, um, put your jumper on. Same old words, which is fine, which is great that they learn that, but it's only in books that you start to meet words like castle and cave and fairy and all of those um, things that, that children also need to learn. So lots of learning for children ahead. It's a big, big job being a kid. So then when we've thought about understanding, we're now thinking about expressive language, how much a child can actually say. So it kind of goes a little bit of a rule of thumb as it goes along with their age. So uh, one year, we're hoping that children have got lots of or beginning to get single words and sounds that mean things. And by two to three years, we're hoping that they're putting two to three words together into little sentences. And then as they get to three and four, we're hoping that the sentences are getting longer and they're beginning to join them together. So not just went park, but I went to the park and I saw a duck. But how do we uh, encourage children to say more? Because we can't just say, no, say a longer sentence. It doesn't work like that. But by commenting on what they're saying and repeating back what they're saying and adding an extra word really helps their expressive language. Um, we do tend to ask a lot of questions when we're with young children. So you meet a child that you haven't seen for a while and you straight away say, you know, oh, how's school and what are you doing and where's this and haven't you grown? And all of those questions we we tend to ask children. And even when we're with our own children at school uh, at home, you know, what are you drawing? Um, and all of those questions that kind of intrude. And Often we ask questions that they know the answer to, like, what color is this? And the child says purple. Well, whoopee, they already knew the answer. So you've just asked them a question that they already know the answer to, or they don't know the word purple and you've just set them up to fail. So cut down your questions because questions put pressure on. So I might say to Hannah, uh, what did you do last night? Hannah, did you watch TV? And she might say, yes, I did. And I'll say, what did you watch? And she'll tell me the film she watched. And then I'll say, who was with you? What snacks did you have? What were you wearing? What time did you go to bed? And by the time I've got to question six, I'm sure you'd be feeling a bit uncomfortable, Hannah, because that's too many questions. It's putting on the pressure and you begin to think, hang on a minute, why do you want to know all this? And children are like that too. Questions aren't that useful for them. Of course, we need to ask them things like, where does it hurt? Or does your tummy hurt? Or do you want pasta or pizza? So all of those important questions are fine, but let's try commenting more, which means uh, instead of questioning, you turn it into just a comment. So not what are you drawing, but that's a lovely drawing, lots of red on that drawing or something like that. And research has shown that commenting is a more successful way than questioning. 
Um, especially cut down those questions during special time. Model that language and turn your questions into comments. So not what are you doing, but you're cooking dinner when the child's in the home corner. And they're more likely to learn new words because you're putting those new words into sentences. You're making dinner in the kitchen. Now, don't worry too much about this. I just put it in to give you a very rough idea about speech sounds. So I said that was so the icing on the cake for children. We're not worried about this for children under three, but as children are beginning to get past the age of three, we're beginning to think about, is their speech as clear as other children? And those sounds up here in the yellow box are the ones that they learn first of all. So it's those front sounds that you can see me making, p, b, m, uh, t, and d. So there are early sounds. And then coming down here are beginning to be some of those later sounds that are um, getting a little bit harder for children to say. So they're actually made further back in the mouth. So k and g and uh, s and h. So um, again, if, you're, if we're thinking about three roles, there, there should only be um, uh, some of these harder sounds that they're still not able to make. I wouldn't be worrying about a child that's not able to say sh or j or um, pl. So some of those um, sounds where we're joining those words, sounds together are really difficult for children. If you're worried, um, please ask uh, your nursery uh, practitioner or um, uh, if you're tied into the children's centre, asking one of our children's centres speech and language therapists. But um, under three, we're definitely more concerned about the amount of child is understanding and what their play's like and how much they're saying rather than speech sounds themselves. So now we're thinking, now we've just revised all uh, about how a, children develops their a child develops their communication. How can I help my child be ready for nursery? That special big step into nursery. So the first thing is to talk, talk, talk about it and using language that's appropriate for a child and what I mean by that is keeping it simple children have very little idea of time so if it's happening in September they'll need lots of reference to it now but you'll need to keep going over it because it's not happening tomorrow it's happening in a long time away but never too early to start talking about it so talk to your child about it and I like the way that mum is right down on that child's level. And what we mean by that is she's crouched down so she can see his eyes. And uh, it's very powerful to be that close and um, in, into the child so that they can see that you're engaged and you can see what reaction they're having to what you're saying. Um, talk about your the, the child's new nursery and the friends and the teacher or anyone you know that's transitioning into nursery at the same time. Use photos from the nursery website or photos if you've taken them with your digital camera, your phone, um, as you go past the nursery. Um, your nursery might have provided you with some photos. And there are lots of lovely, lovely books about starting nursery that you can get from your uh, your local library and I bet they've probably got a display of them at the moment because they're so aware about children starting nursery and children starting reception. Think about uniform and their self-care skills. Are they able to pull their jumper over their heads? Do they know the names of things like jumper and trousers and socks and shoes? So if they're going to be wearing something special for school, uh, practice trying it on, talking about their school uniform. If they don't have a uniform, practice putting on clothes, trying to support children to be as independent as possible. Name clothes as you put them on, that's a great way for them to learn that this is the t-shirt, this is the trousers. Practice dressing a favourite dolly or teddy and talking about him going to school or nursery. Think about the journey. Are you going to be walking to nursery or getting the bus or driving? So talking to your child about how that's going to happen. 
plan and practice the route. You can have fun doing that over the holidays. Um, do exactly the route that you'll take and talk about it um, as you go and what you see, taking photos as you go. So take those photos of the bus or the buildings so that you can talk about them later. Talk about who will come with you. Or is anybody else going to be on your school run, so to speak? Or will anybody else be taking them some mornings? And you can talk about what you've seen. Oh, and get books out of the library about different types of transport as well, if, if you're going to be going on a bus or um, however you're going to get there. Oh, that finishes quite quickly. <laughs> so just a whole load of information there, thinking about how young children's communication develops and then thinking about how we can support a child um, with a really big step because um, going to nursery uh, is a big leap for children and the more prepared they are and the more secure they are with their language skills so that they're able to express themselves. Do they know how to ask a question? Do they know how to ask for help? That's a really important one. Um, just even as simple as every time a child sort of pulls you to ask you to help them with something, just say, help me, just so you're modeling exactly what you would like the child to say to a teacher, for example, because they will be obviously going to the toilet, etc. cetera, um, at nursery. So asking for help is a really important one. Are they able to turn to their name? That's another really important one. And are they prepared in knowing as much about this next step as they possibly can be? So I hope I haven't bamboozled you with too much information there, but very happy to take any questions. And we've also got Hannah here on the call, uh, Hannah Scaife, um, who will be happy, I'm sure, to answer any questions um, as well. One thing I haven't spoken about is bi and trilingual children. So if your child doesn't speak English, um, our nurseries are very, very well set up to support children who are only just being um, exposed to English for the first time. So don't be concerned about that, but just share as much information with the nursery as you possibly can um, so that they know whether you feel their home language is where you would like it to be or, or whether you're concerned that that isn't developing as well as you would expect it to. And also um, a few phrases for the nursery staff to know um, so that they're aware of, um, you know, just how to, to sort of, uh, communicate with your little one in those very early days. But English very soon comes for children once they're you know, settled in nursery. Sharish, did you have a question? You've got a green box around you. No, I'm fine. Thank okay. You. Any questions from anyone? You could also, if you have a question, you could type it in the chat box, which mm -hmm. is on the bottom. There's a little speech bubble. Just going back to what you were saying, Joe, about um, children arriving at nursery without speaking English. The first teaching job I had was um, most of the children came in mostly speaking Punjabi. And so I learned some words in Punjabi and I still remember them now. And it was such a long time ago, oh. but just simple phrases um, that I thought would help the children. And soon they were, you know, really learning English and speaking English, but it was, yeah, I think it's teachers do that staff, nursery staff will do that. Absolutely. And just remembering that bi and trilingual children are in the majority worldwide. And also um, it's a real gift to have given a child to be bi and trilingual because it's fantastic to be able to communicate to different sets of people. And also even brain scans can show um, if you have brain scans of people who are you know you know lingual monoly monolingual versus bilingual, actually the bilingual. Um, brains show up on a scan as more densely packed, which is one of those um, things that they believe staves off Alzheimer's. So, so many reasons to raise a child in a bi or trilingual if you possibly can. 
Yes, if anyone missed the beginning, it's um, it, it has been recorded. Um, how will they get hold of a copy, Hannah? Um, so all of the recordings from Monday, today and Friday, the one on toilet training, they'll all be put onto the Family Information Service um, on Wandsworth Family Information Service, but they need to be put onto YouTube first. So it will probably be in a week or two. Perfect. Thank you. Well, I'll hang around for a minute or two. So if anyone's got any questions, please do stay. Otherwise, thank you very much. And thank you from your children uh, for uh, coming here to look, learn a little bit more about supporting children at this important stage. And I hope they get on really well. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, everyone.